Appreciate it. All right. So guys, um, like I said, my name is Johan de Pria. Um, I've got a small firm here in Cape Town, a boutique firm, where we specialize in individual tax, especially foreign tax. And we've got a big footprint in the mining industry. And um, yeah, we've got about 20 years worth of experience. Most of the people that work for us have honors degrees in some form of specialization in taxation. And as you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about what's happening regarding um, foreign immigration. And we're here to give you some guidelines on what will work and what will not work. So the content uh, which we're gonna be discussing today, um, all be relating, and those are the six points on the next slide, Michael, um, would be regarding the South African foreign employment income, the exemption, what has changed, tax residency, ordinary versus physical present, the double taxation with SA in Singapore, rebates and potential remedies. And I actually just want to see, because now I'm struggling to see your screen, Michael, no, I'll just read off mine. Um, examples of tax calculations, and then we'll have some questions afterwards. Just something to note, we do have professional indemnity, but this webinar is meant to be informative. It's not complete, and it's not tailor-made necessarily to your unique circumstances. So if you do have questions, please ask. We'll try and attend to them at the end. And afterwards, you can perhaps also have a private consultation. Now note, the South African government wants to keep a relationship it got with its residents outside of South Africa. And that's why they haven't scrapped the exemption at all. They said, guys, South Africa is your home. This is your country. Let's see how we can make it that you find it still beneficial to work outside and still be a resident in South Africa because we want you to return. We want you to come have a bra again. Now, um, on the next page, what has changed in South Africa regarding tax residents? Michael, could you page that for us? Thank you very much. The first thing to bear in mind, there is still an exemption. There's always been an exemption and the exemption is still ongoing. Um, Section 10102 provides an exemption for foreign employment. And I just want to stop here. It's foreign employment, meaning you have to be employed by somebody on the other side. You can't be a sole proprietor employing people in Singapore and then says this applies to you. It will imply being to your staff, but it won't apply to yourself. So Section 10102 provides for an exemption for foreign employment income received for services rendered outside South Africa, provided the requirements are met. Now, before 1st of March, as you know, everything was exempt, the whole amount. From 1 March, the exemption is limited to 1.25 million rand. Any remuneration received in excess of this amount will be subject to normal tax in South Africa, and we'll discuss with normal tax. And if I'm not mistaken, the 1.25 million rand equates to roughly 95,000 Singaporean dollars. So that's a more or less the amount that will be exempt from your employment now in Singapore. Next page, please. What has changed for South African tax residents? Now, before 1 March 2020, an employee who was tax resident of South Africa only had to be outside of South Africa for 183 days in aggregate during any 12-month period, including a continuous period exceeding 64 days during a 12-month period to have a foreign income exempted in terms of a section. Now, that's very important here, that 60-day section. So what used to happen, especially guys working in Africa that was closer, they would be out of country 200, 300 days a year, but they would come back at the end of every month to visit their families. They would not qualify for this exemption because they never had a full 60-day break not being in South Africa. So the 183 days was quite easily attainable for guys working abroad, but that 60 days was a requirement that some people just couldn't meet. Then, what is the definition of foreign income? Now, this includes salary, taxable benefits, your leave pay, your wage, your overtime, bonuses, gratuity, commission, fee, your emoluments, your travel allowances, amounts received from employee share plans, and amounts received in respect of share vesting. And there's some very nice um, exemptions for the share vesting, because some people will be back in South Africa, and then only the vesting will occur, then we will still be exemption applied, um, and we can discuss that in private afterwards. So, if we turn to the next place, what is a South African tax resident? Now, South Africa uses a residence-based tax system, which means persons who are resident in the Republic are taxed on their worldwide income, irrespective of how it's earned. And there's certain exclusions. 
non-residents are ever taxed on all the income from sources within the Republic. So what that means, if you're a non-resident and you buy some property in South Africa and you rent it out, you're taxed in South Africa on that property if you're a non-resident. Let's say you're a German citizen, you open a B&B &B in South Africa. From a trading income in South Africa, you'll be taxed in South Africa, but the South African government can't tax any of your other income because you're not a South African tax resident. We can only tax on the source, which is South Africa. Now you've got a South African that leaves the country, they go to Singapore, Germany, the States, wherever they go, and they earn income there. Then the South African government says, but I've got the right to tax you on all the income you make from source in South Africa, because you might have rented out your house, you might still have a dividend portfolio, some um, money in the bank earning interest, that's taxable in South Africa. But then your foreign income is also taxable. And previously, and I know a lot of people did not do this, you were supposed to declare that money on your tax return, what you earned abroad, and then you would have said, but it's exempt on your tax return. So SARS would have been aware of it, but you would have not paid any tax on it. Right. So a natural person is a resident of income tax purposes. If a natural person A is ordinary resident in the Republic, or B meets all the requirements for the physical present test. And then there's a third one being, if it's in terms of a DTA, double tax agreement. And this we can find all in section one of the definitions in the Income Tax Act. So South African tax residency. Um, next page, please. We get to the physical present test and then the ordinary residence test. Michael, next page, please. Now the physical presence test was meant more for foreigners coming to South Africa, or we'll call them non-residents, operating here and leaving the country to tax their income they earn in South Africa and then also which they earn abroad. So there was a requirement of you had to be, and let's just read it, it's for a natural person to be regarded as a resident for tax purposes in the year under consideration if the requirements are that such a person must be physically present in SA for a period or periods exceeding 91 days in aggregate during year of assessment under consideration, 91 days in aggregate during each of the five years of assessment preceding the year of assessment under consideration, and 915 days in aggregate during the five preceding years of assessment. So this section was written to tax non-residents spending time in South Africa. That's a reason for this. So most of you would not fall into this category. This would be again for your German or your American spending time in South Africa and feeling that they're not spending enough time to be taxed here. Then they might fall into this net and say, no, you're actually South African tax resident. Now, the one that will apply to most of you is the next slide. What does it mean to be ordinary resident? Now, in short, this means that South Africa is a place that you will eventually return to from your wanderings. It's the place that we consider your habitual abode. It's the center of your vital interest. And this you can find interpretation note three. And I just want to mention here, if you want any of the interpretation notes, we'll gladly provide it to you. So basically we're saying it's your home. Your ordinary resident is what is your home? Now, how do you determine if you're ordinary resident or not? Well, let's go have a look. Next page, please, Michael. Johan, before, before we go on to the the next page, I think the physical residence and the ordinarily resident, yes. it's important to note that they're distinctively different. Now, Definitely. Phys physically present, you are physically present within the period stipulated um, in the previous slide, but ordinarily resident is a little bit more difficult to, to determine. Would you agree with that? No, definitely. And that's where most of the uh legal disputes come from and that's why we've got so much case law on this and very important when we look so the physical present test you basically use your passport to determine it so it's cut and dry now you test for yeah. 91 days five-year period etc you say 915 in total you are or you aren't very easy the ordinary residence a much more complicated one to test and we see this right over the globe again i know especially german um, what's his name boris becker he's been taxed because he just spent one night in his old flat. And they said, ah, oh, you're an ordinary resident of Germany again. So tax authorities like to tax you based on ordinary resident. And that's why there are a lot of things to test to see if you're ordinary resident in the country. Because a very good example would be um, you working in Singapore, you might work there for 40 years, basically your whole adult life. 
but the South African government might still say you're actually an ordinary resident in SA because you deem this to be your home. And then we go check, there's a test we're going to do to see if you, this is your ordinary home or not. And a lot of times this will result in disputes. And what we've seen, the only time this will be dispute, if it puts you in the worst tax position, then you obviously will dispute it. If it's not a worst tax position, it won't matter to you. But if you're in a worst tax position, you'll say, no, I'm definitely not ordinary resident. And that's the reason why we have to assess whether you are or not. And again, there's a lot of legal opinions about this and legal cases to say, what is your natural boat? Where will you return to from your wanderings? And there's some question, um, some key notes we can look at to discuss it. And you know, um, if you wouldn't mind turning the page. Sure. And, I mean, one of them is it's, it's, it's yeah. so vague, Johan, the return from your wanderings. And as you say, the next page will explain it. I uh, just wanted to highlight that piece of case law. Yeah, well, I actually want to, let's use a practical example. Um, Michael, you're coming back to South Africa. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I don't know if you're married or not, but you get married, you get have kids, and you might have settled to settle in the UK. That might be your decision, or wherever in Australia. And then you actually yeah. never return to South Africa. So a lot of the aspects about being an ordinary resident might change dep depending on what happens in your life. Your family might immigrate and leave SA, um, resulting that you don't want to return. doesn't matter if you like the weather or the land or whatever <laughs> the case might be. So it's, to me, it's always a moving target. And that's why we end up in court a lot of the times, saying, no, um, it's changed. And your intention can change over time. Bear that in mind. You're not locked into a decision forever. So when you left South Africa, you could have said, I'm never coming back. And now you're not coming back. Sorry, you want to say something? I, I, just, I just say um, the onus is always on the taxpayer to prove that, though, isn't it? Correct. And, uh, you know, we've actually found that SARS is very fair in this assumption. But um, they're very fair when there's not a lot of money involved. Let me actually <laughs> emphasize that. When there's a lot of money involved, it's almost like the fairness goes away. And you're quite right. Now you have to prove behind the shadow of a doubt. And here are the, the points we can just look at to take into consideration, and then we'll discuss it afterwards a bit. One, is there an intention for you to be ordinary resident in the Republic? So that's one of the things we'll look at. The second one, we'll look at the natural person's most... Um, fixed and settled place of residence. Now, I read an article about, um, what's his name, Ron Pinar yesterday, playing now for the Cheetahs again in South Africa, but he kept his flat in Ireland and he's made it abundantly clear that he feels he should be living in Ireland. So I can tell you, not far from now, we'll see an article where he's testing this in court, where he's going to say he's not an SA tax resident and he's only spending time in South Africa to make money again. He's supposed to be back in Ireland. So they will look at what's your most fixed and settled place of residence and then we have a look at, oh, you've got a flat which you're renting in Singapore, but you've got a three-story house in South Africa where you keep your car collection and your stamp collection. They say, no, no, that's clearly your residence. Um, then a natural person's habits will abode. That is the place where a person stays most often and his or her present habits of mode of life. Now, this one, we actually don't see being used that much anymore because people started living all over the place. My mother-in-law, for example, is married to a Frenchman, but she lives in the UK. So every, I think, second week, she goes across to spend some time with him in France, and he does it the other way around, and then they come visit us in South Africa. So for them, it's actually very difficult to prove where she lives because he rents a flat, she rents a flat, and then they come to South Africa. So where's their permanent residence? I don't think they've determined that yet. So a lot of these things will be up in the air. And like you said, the, it's the onus will be on you as a taxpayer to prove this, but that's why we'll make an argument and you come to tax consultants and we'll, see, we'll look at something that will work. Next, the place of business and personal interest of a natural person he, and his or her family. Now, if you're on an employment contract for five years, you can argue that this is not permanent. You know, um, after five years, this contract will be cancelled. But this is something the tax authorities will look at. The status of the individual in the Republic and in other countries, for example, whether he or she is an immigrant and what the work permit periods and conditions are. Um, you, you'll be well aware you can get different kinds of work permits. You can apply for residency in another country. All of those factors will be taken into consideration determining if you are a tax resident or not. Then the natural person's nationality, that will be taken into consideration, family and social relations, 
a school, a place of worship, sport and social clubs. So sometimes we may test this, and there's a very good example, I think from the 50s, where the person kept, um, he remained a member, I think, of Old National Party, he kept his church membership in South Africa, and he kept his golf um, subscription alive at the club. But he went to the state and said, no, I'm not a South African tax resident. And they said, no, you definitely are a South African tax resident. Because this is where everything will be happening for you on your return. This is where all your social relations are. Then we look at political, cultural, and other activities. We look at the natural person's application for permanent residency or citizenship in another country. And that's very important. That normally will be the defining factor. Have you made the switch to move or not? And I know this is a piece of paperwork that the revenue officer would like to see. A lot of people working on a contract abroad actually will not have this because they wouldn't have applied for citizenship. Maybe permanent residency, but not citizenship. But that's something we'll use. Then we'll look at the periods abroad, the purpose and the nature of your visits there and back in South Africa, the frequency and reason for visits. And I mean, if you're overseas, you know how there is. Uh, somebody gets sick in, in South Africa, whatever conditions, heart attack, whatever. You climb on the airplane, you fly back to South Africa, and then suddenly you spend a month here. We look at all of it and say, but look, whenever there's trouble, you come back to South Africa. This is actually a place where you live. Then employment and economic factors. And lastly, the location of the natural person's personal belongings. And this is actually being used in a lot of cases to say, but this is where you actually should be tax resident. And then we look at things like your art collection, um, your stamp collection, your coin collection. Where do you keep your cars? Where do you keep your boat? Um, some guys will have airplanes. Where is all of this kept? And those personal belongings is a good indication of where you are deciding your natural boat actually is. But very important, Michael, this is not an exhaustive list. There are a lot more that can be added. And that's the reason why when this is tested in, um, or contested, let me rather say, by SARS, that we end up in court saying no, that we disagree for the following reasons. Right. And as you've now gone through this, Johan, I think everyone watching would agree that this is quite a long and wide net of things that SARS is going to try and catch you with. Um, so just because you don't tick a few of these boxes, it doesn't mean they can't say, well, you do tick the others, therefore you could be considered ordinarily resident. Correct. You know, and I think Boris Becker remains a good example. Um, him just visiting or staying in his flat for one night in Germany. And they say, oh, the reason for the visit, the frequency, you're actually still a German tax resident. And trust me, the tax authorities all operate in a similar manner. And we'll use that as an example of African tax law in the future, I'm sure. And I'll say, but look, this is actually where you want to be, not in the country next to us. So you're quite right. You might be ticking the boxes on 10 of them, and two of them you fail. They say, no, this is the scenario. This is what we're choosing. But then we challenge it. And, you yes. know, the way I see it, nothing's written in stone. So it's always open for challenge. And then depending on how much money is involved, we go to court. But yes. I need to be fair. Um, SARS has been very accommodating of late um, because the government once incentivized people to come back to South Africa. So, yes, they're trying to tax the money you're earning abroad, but they're also trying to make it, I want to use the word, comfortable for you to be tax compliant and to be returning to South Africa. And that's something yes. to bear in mind. They're not aggressive in this scenario. They're actually very accommodating. And I think it's, it's very interesting. Basically, if you had to summarize this, this would be how you establish a person's vital interests. I mean, where's your family? Where do you socialize? Where, what is your political affiliation? You know, these are all your vital interests. And where's your most fixed and settled place of residence? This is the most vital interests of your life. Correct. And, you know, a lot of people make a mistake to say, oh, but I have coffee or drinks after office with my fellow colleagues. So this is where I socialize. They look at socialize as where do you go to for birthday parties? Where do you go to for um, weddings and funerals? That's what, well, funerals is not really socializing. Well, being my <laughs> lockdown, it probably is. But um, <laughs> it's the only time we can interact with other people, even though it's very sad. But um, that's what they look at. And so it's actually those odd things you do in between. They say, oh, this is your real socializing. This is your real intent. Yes. And I think the, the second last one in terms of employment and economic factors, 
a lot of the people that are here in Singapore will be here on what's called an employment pass. It is basically your visa for staying in the country. It's your work permission given by your employer and the government here. Your, but that is dependent on uh, your contract of employment. As you mentioned earlier, maybe I've been employed here for five years. It doesn't mean that I've become a permanent resident. It doesn't mean I've become a citizen of Singapore. Does that mean that because I'm here on an EP that I could be considered ordinary resident because it's a temporary visa? Definitely. And you know, the government is looking for money. So they're going to argue that fact saying you haven't become a citizen. You haven't applied for permanent residency. You're basically on the form of a work visa. So no, you fall part of a South African tax need. Yes. Okay. I think a lot of people here will, would fall into that trap. Um, and then in Singapore, it's also, it's not easy to get permanent residence, but it's easier than some other na nations across the world. So if someone was necessarily a permanent resident, for example, here in Singapore, but they still visit South Africa once a year, maybe just to visit family and they have no other vital interests, would that make it their ordinary resident because they are returning to see family. No, no that won't make them ordinary resident, um, but SARS would like to test it, you know, if yes. they're going to challenge it. So we would like to test it. My opinion would be you're not ordinary resident anymore. Um, you've, your life has shifted. You're living in Singapore. That's where all your vital interests are. And you're actually just coming back home to visit. And again, the government won't penalize you just visiting family. They want us to have a relationship. With the, yes. Yeah, with the citizens that left. Okay. All right. Well, Johan, I think we've got lots of very decent questions coming through here. So we'll just uh, leave those for later and continue to the next part now. All right. Uh -huh. So when we're looking at South African tax residency, sometimes um, we need to be a tiebreaker, a tiebreaker test between two countries. And you'll see there's five points here, which we're going to look at. And most of them in terms of a double tax agreement that will be existing, which is governed by Article 4 and 5 in any DTA. All the details are written in a similar manner. And we can look at the tiebreaker test. And this is, um, yeah, where an individual is a resident of both SA and Singapore, then the individual status shall be determined as follows. And here are the five points to look at. The first one, and I think this might answer some of the questions that has been raised, deemed to be resident we either have a permanent home available to them. If they have a permanent home in both states, then, then only continue. So it will be that you left South Africa, a lot of people left South Africa very young. So they never had any property here, but they've got property in the foreign country. They say, no, look, here's your permanent home available. And that will be a time breaker test at that point. They say, no, so when you're actually Singaporean, you're not South African. Um, if you don't have a permanent home in either country, then let's have a look, or you have in both countries, they deem to be the resident where their personal and economic relations are closer, the center of vital interest we have just discussed. Now, if this individual has a center of vital interest in both, then we have to continue again. So, on point one, if you can prove, oh, but I've bought a house here in Singapore, I've never owned property in South Africa, I've never really had big ties here, I left off the varsity, that should help. This isn't a tiebreaker test, just by the way, where both countries want to tax you. This is not your normal tax just for residency. This is where both countries say, no, you're normally your ordinary resident for Singapore and for South Africa. Then number two, we'll look at your vital interest. Again, if you can prove you've got vital interest in both, then we go over to number three. Number three will be deemed to be the resident where they have a habitable abode. Now, if individuals have a habitable abode in both states, or in neither of them, which is sometimes the case, they will go over to four, and this is deemed to be the resident in state where they are a national. So if you're not a national in Singapore, but in South Africa, then in this state, South Africa would win. Now, if an individual is a national of both states, or of neither of them, then it will be per mutual agreement. And what we've seen per mutual agreement, the country where you're physically staying, they will win. They just say, no, you're an ordinary resident here, that's it. Yes. Yeah. But listen here, even if you're deemed to be resident in both, I mean, we're going to be discussing now when we continue, there's a lot of tax relief to be offered. So it's nothing to be concerned about. Um, it all depends on what kind of tax residency you are. 
but nothing here to be concerned about. So if a tiebreaker does exist if there's a dispute, and this is a dispute between the two countries. This is not you disputing it. This is for countries disputing, saying now you're ordinary resident in both. Um, we've got it with Malta, for example, where Malta would say you're tax resident there, and South Africa would say you're tax resident here in South Africa. And depending on where you're tax resident, there's special preferential rights you'll get in, in terms of the actual double tax agreement for dividends it's not outside the scope of this. And then we would like to argue that you're actually tax resident in Malta. And then we use all these points to say, but look, a guy has sold his house in South Africa. He's attending a church there. He's kids on school in Malta. And we say, okay, this is a tiebreaker test and we move him across. And he's no longer a tax resident in South Africa. Yes. And so just a, a question on, on my half then would be, for example, I do not own a home in South Africa nor in uh, Singapore. So therefore... I would then proceed to step two. Now, personal and economic relations. My economic relations are all based in Singapore. My business is here, my job is here, um, all of my savings and investments, etc., all in Singapore. But personal basis, my family is back home. I mean, how would they decide that that part? I suppose is the question just on the basis that families back home and out here is where I live and have economic relations. You know, as soon as you start adding a spouse, you know, to the equation and you and the spouse live abroad, then you start moving away saying, this is where my personal relations are closer, actually in Singapore. But let's say you're still unmarried, then the argument comes that you've actually got a set of vital interests in both. And then we slip over to number three again. So um, most people, and number one should be tiebreaker, should settle with tiebreaker. But if you go over to number two, it becomes an, I don't want to call it an argument, but you put points forward, motivating where you really are. And we, we found that, again, uh, SARS has been very accommodating and very fair, but in a time where they need money, we suspect that the fairness might be overseen for money, that they're going to try and tax where they can, which I understand why we need the money, but obviously, you would not like to be taxed twice. Sure. I suppose we're going to have a lot of very interesting case law where this is going to be argued in the years to come and precedents will be set. A fortune, and then we're going to get to financial immigration as well. You know, we a lot of people just waving that saying, oh, I've got an immunity card, you can't tax me, and they're just going to rip through that. <laughs> so we'll see interesting case law coming up still, but we'll get to it. All right, um, can we page over to the next one? tiebreaker tie test, what happens if Singapore wins? So this is very important. So let's say you're now in Singapore, they weren't saying you're tax resident in South Africa. And actually just gonna take one step back. Why would you not want to be tax resident in Singapore, but still be tax resident in South Africa? Well, very simple. If you're not tax resident in South Africa anymore, you were supposed to do a declaration to source of all your assets and pay capital gains tax on the date you left. And it's not physically the date you left on the plane, it's the date that you made your mind shift. You could have been in Singapore for six months or four years saying, I'm actually gonna stay here. And then you should have said, listen, I'm gonna be here permanently. And that would have triggered an exit tax, which will be point number three. And that's why that's very important to note because that tax can be very expensive. So for that reason, you might prefer to be tax resident still in both countries. So let's just look at it. The individual ceases to be a SA tax resident Accordingly, the individual is not liable for income tax in ESA any further, and this will be on income, worldwide income, excepting for his ESA source income. That will always be taxable in South Africa. And I know this has been a misconception with a lot of people that left South Africa saying, oh, we're out of the country for more than 183 days. Whatever we earn is tax-free. That's not true. It's only the employment income you earn abroad that's tax-free. Whatever dividends, interest, rental income you've earned in South Africa remains taxable in South Africa. Also, if you lived abroad and you're still tax resident in South Africa, I think I just need to cover this. And let's say you bought a flat and you started renting that flat out, that flat's taxable in South Africa as well. And there's no exemption in terms of the Section 10120. It's only the foreign income that's exempted. So next step, when you cease to be, or when do you, did you cease to be a resident? And this is open for debate a lot of the times, especially some guys would say it's the date I climb, climbed on a plane, but practically it's when you make the mind shift saying, yeah, I'm not returning to South Africa. And we see that especially if people would leave South Africa after varsity, they say, no, I'm coming back, coming back. 
five, six years later, we say, no, I'm not coming back. And then, then you've made a decision, actually not before then. Now the exit tax, this is an individual deemed to have disposed of the assets on the day before ceasing to be resident at market value. And this is what makes it expensive to become a non-resident in South Africa if you've got assets in the country. And this will relate to your share portfolios, all the assets you own, excepting immovable property. And if you have a company that owns your house, which sometimes is the case, and in that company, the house makes up more than 80% of the value, it will be included in this exemption that you don't have to pay the CGT just yet. They'll wait until you sell it one day, and then they'll tax you on it. So that's some relief the government is giving, saying, you know, we don't want you to sell your property just to pay CGT. We'll wait until you've decided to sell it. Because again, they want you to return to South Africa and having a fixed property in the country makes it easier to return. So how is this practically achieved? Well, you file your tax return and when you indicate that you're non-resident and it's as simple as a little block you tick and say, non-resident. That or even the background triggers a lot of things. And that's why we've got the submit supporting documents, the tax residency certificate from Singapore, et cetera, and deal with any tiebreaker or objection that might exist. However, when you tick that block, it triggers CGT, um, call it an exit tax if you want to. That's what it triggers at that stage. So just bear in mind, you will have to pay capital gains on whatever assets you had at this stage. Now, something to note, the rents devalued a lot. So it might be beneficial for you to say, yes, I'm leaving the country and due to the rand devaluating, the tax has actually become cheaper because you're paying it from your Singaporean dollars because it's still calculated in rands. That hasn't changed at all. So if this might be an opportune time to settle your South African tax bill, if you were considering it, myself, I would however, just say, you know, keep a property and wait until you've decided you want to sell it. And not just for property, the residency, if it's going to be beneficial to be resident in both countries, then rather leave it as such. Do you have any comments on that, Michael? I think it's it, it's all understood. Um, the For me, the filing the tax return and indicating you are not a resident. So the block you are referring to that you tick is at the bottom of your ROP5. Is that correct? No, no. it's actually on your IT12 return. Now, this okay. is something a lot of people that's left South Africa has failed to do, still to complete the income tax return for form ID12 in South Africa. And even if your income is exempt, you still declare it on that return and you just, you can say I've got exempt income, you declare it a million, two million, three million, whatever it is, it will be selected for an audit. I can promise you that. And then your email in, well, not email in, you'll upload your supporting documents, which would be your employment contract and basically your passport, proving you were out of the country more than 183 days. That's what we used to do in the olden days to prove you're totally exempt. It will still apply in the future with a 1.25 million exemption will upload by identical documents. Okay. And yeah. Good. Well, also, um, what I've seen here is that people can apply with the IRAS, which is the Singaporean Tax Authority, um, yes. for a residency certificate. And it's just a simple one page document from the South African Tax, uh, I mean, sorry, the Singaporean Tax Authority stating that um, you are a tax resident of Singapore. Now, would that be sufficient for tax residence certificate or the uploading of the supporting documents? Um, in my opinion, yes. Again, we've seen it being challenged and then we go back to the whole long list to see if you're tax resident or not. Right. Okay. We have so to prove go it. back to the ordinary resident. Correct. But in short, the answer would be yes. And normally when you, you tick yes, it's an exit tax, I'm leaving the country and there's some form of capital gain. So, SARS is more than happy to receive the money. And I can tell you now, in the last two years, we've had so many people going that route that they're accustomed to see it. It's not something foreign like 10 years ago. So we're seeing so many of us that they've become much more, again, accommodating, accepting it and saying, all right, that's fine, the person has left. And then in 10 years, if you want to come back, I'll take you back onto a tax base, not a problem. Yeah, I mean, it's a win for them, isn't it? It, it, listen, it's a win for them if you leave because they get the CGT. It's a win for them if you stay in the tax base because they'll get the excess above the exemption. So, yes. um, but the CGT normally will be a bigger lump sum of money right now. 
but over time it will be better for them to keep you on the tax basis right so to summarize on this slide then once you have said that you are non-resident and you've sub submitted the supporting documents this could trigger exit tax or cgt capital gains tax and this will be levied on all property except your immovable properties correct so all your share investments etc everything will be triggered immovable property is the only thing that's excluded right fantastic yeah. okay right. so this tiebreaker test now we move on to double tax agreement right double tax agreement now obviously the government's brought our double tax agreement for the sole purpose that people will not come and work in Singapore, they're going to be taxed twice. It just doesn't make commercial sense. And there's a lot of economic value being added, having your citizens work in different countries. So they said, listen, let's get together, let's sign double tax agreements, giving relief to parties working in more than one country. And um, you can see it here on the screen, this particular agreement, and this is almost generic to all double tax agreements, the provision of a tax treaty, if applicable, will apply to a portion of the remuneration and very important, remuneration. This is not if you're a sole proprietor or having your own company on that side, this is if you're an employee, over and above 1.25 million. Generally, under the provisions of a tax treaty, if an employee renders services in a foreign country, and remember one of the first slides, we defined what is employment income, for a period or periods exceeding 183 full days, both countries enjoy the right to tax that income. The country of source in this scenario, Singapore, enjoys the first right to tax employment income and the country of tax residents in South Africa will provide tax relief in the form of foreign tax credit and we'll get to an article called the Six Quad to the extent that the tax was paid in both countries subject to certain limitations. So the tax authorities recognize they have to give you some form of tax break otherwise it just won't be commercially viable for you to do this and to go work in Singapore and still be taxed in full South Africa without any form of break. Understood. So in terms of employee, would, I mean, there's a lot of um, South Africans here that are holding directorships in, in companies, multinational, as well as South African based and international based. If you okay. are a director, are you still considered an employee? Yes. No, directors are definitely considered employees. Okay. So if, if it's a, I'm going to um, explain by a typical example. Um, I'm a sole proprietor, so I don't have a company, I trade on my own name. I've got 10 employees, I climb on the plane, I've got a contract in Nigeria, and I go work in Nigeria with my nine employees. Um, of that nine employees, four of them come back every month to come visit their families. We're out of the country for a full year. How will we even be taxed? Because I'm a sole proprietor and I'm not employed by anybody. I don't get this tax break. I get taxed in full on the income I made in Nigeria. My five employees that did not return to South Africa, but stayed in Nigeria the whole time, so they've got that 183 days, plus that 60 continuous days, they pay no tax in South Africa, um, if they earned less than 1.25 million using this exemption, and before 1st of March, they would have paid no tax whatsoever, but then they can claim the full exemption. Those four employees have decided to return to South Africa every month to come visit their families, even though they worked outside the country, call it then for 250 days, just counting out the weekends, will be fully taxed in South Africa because they never had a continuous period of 60 days. So there you can see the difference between a sole proprietor, an employee that stayed out of the country, an employee that returned to the country, not having a 60 day break. I think that's a very, very good answer. <laughs> it's a perfect example, thank you. All right. All right. So now I think it will be important for us to start looking at potential remedies um, for this. So right. moving on. Right, so, all right, so listen, you can read the slide yourselves. What basically Article 21 of a double tax agreement says is when you pay tax in Singapore, it can't put you in a credit in South Africa. So if the Singaporean tax is, let's say, 300,000 rand for argument's sake, and the tax in South Africa would only be 250,000, then your Singaporean tax, which we're gonna be deducting from a South African tax liability, will be limited, limited to the 250,000. So South Africa won't give you a refund if the other country taxed you higher than South Africa would tax you, if that makes sense. So 
So there's no refund that this will generate. However, if the Singaporean tax is 250,000 and the South African tax is 300,000, the other way around then, then you'll pay 50,000 tax still in South Africa. So this is just a, the article 21 is just to say that you can't get more tax relief in South Africa than what you paid in Singapore and accordingly you can't get a refund in South Africa for the Singaporean tax paid. Understood. So essentially it can't exceed the amount. Yes, okay, that makes sense very, very much so. All right, so I suppose now we will we'll see practicality um, and how does this work practically in terms of tax credits and um, by way of example. Um, Correct. Well, no, no, it's well, not financial migration. This is the because most important question, actually. It, it definitely is. We should know a lot of people cross bras or playing golf and say, ah, oh, financial immigration, I've done it, I'm sorted. But they yeah. still visit South Africa, they still have their houses here, and they say, listen, I've done it, so I'm free. The problem here is, and if you can just tap once the slide, we've got a reserve bank. Now, financial immigration is done with a reserve bank. Now, SARS is totally a different body from the South African Reserve Bank. So when you financially immigrate, it's only something you tick with a South African Reserve Bank. In real terms, it means nothing to SARS. But it hasn't changed your tax status at SARS. And you'll see even the budget speech we had in the February, the minister said financial immigration won't be processed after 31st of March 2021 anymore. So you've got less than a year to do it because there's no value in it from a tax perspective. Then the question is, why did everybody do, or why would you do financial immigration? There's one main reason why you would do financial immigration, and that is to unlock your pension. This is the only way you can get your pension out of South Africa. It will be taxed when you take it out, but if you financially immigrate, you're entitled to take a full pension out of the country. So yes, that would be a motivation to do financial immigration. But however, now you're sitting in Singapore, you've decided I'm gonna do financial immigration, because I want my pension, whatever pension value is. But you still own property in South Africa, you've got some shares or whatever case might be. It's a triggering event for all of those assets to pay CGT. So you have to ask yourself, is it worthwhile paying the capital gains tax to get to my pension, yes or no? And if the answer is yes, then do financial immigration if it suits you. But the financial immigration is not the answer. It's two different bodies. It's only got to do with a reserve bank. Right. So, in terms of that very lengthy list we looked at with ordinarily residents earlier, financial immigration could help to make that case. It could play a part of that larger test, but it's not the direct answer to being taxed. 100%. And you know, we've seen so much being written about it, and the first three or four months, everyone was arguing this is for answer. And then it became abundantly clear it's not for answer. It's actually only administrative tick you're doing. And when clients ask me, should I do it? I said, listen, if you want your pension out, if the answer is yes, then go for it. But it's not an answer to get yourself out of a South African tax loop. And it creates other problems for you coming back to South Africa because you won't have a normal bank account anymore in South Africa. Now, so there's some yes. other things you need to consider at that stage as well. Okay. So here are our potential remedies for if you do uh, become liable for tax in South Africa over and above your Singaporean tax. Correct. Um, firstly, proof without a doubt that you're not ordinary resident in SA. If you don't want to pay taxes in Africa, prove that you're not ordinary resident in South Africa, and then your worldwide income won't be taxed in South Africa, only your South African tax, but just remember, then you'll have to pay an exit tax. This will be a triggering event for CGT if you go for this option, but that's one option that's available for remedy. Number two, is financial immigration the answer? The answer is no. It's definitely not the answer. It results in a triggering event for CGT immediately. And you can still be liable on your South African, in on your worldwide income in South Africa, even though you've done a financial immigration. So that's not a solution. Um, we've looked at the double tax agreements and part of a double tax agreement or similar to it is called a section six quad rebate and we can stand still here for a while. Um, and something to note, if there was no double tax agreement, you would still be able to claim a section six quad, six quad rebate in terms of tax law. What a six quad rebate is, and let's actually just read it first. This refers to a foreign tax rebate in respect of foreign tax on income from a non-South African source. Section six quad one provides a relief for foreign taxes 
proved to be payable on in income derived from a foreign source that is included in the residence taxable income. So in short, South Africa will give you a tax credit against the South African tax liability of whatever tax you paid in a foreign country in respect of the income they're trying to tax in South Africa. So if your salaried income in Singapore is taxed, and let's say, for example, we previously paid 250,000 in tax in Singapore, South Africa tax the same income saying, you're, no, you're a South African tax resident, we're gonna tax you on the same money, and just ignore the 1.25 million exemption for now, they say the South African tax liability is 300,000, then that 250 in terms of section six squat can be deducted from a South African tax liability. Um, what we do need is evidence that you've paid the tax abroad and that we normally do in the form of your tax assessment being generated in Singapore. Right, so essentially any taxes that you have paid in Singapore for your employment income here in Singapore can be deducted from your tax liability in South Africa if there is any tax liability. Correct. We just need evidence that you've paid the tax in Singapore. And just before you go off at screen, there are two more um, remedies, potential remedies we can apply. Um, the fourth one will be your medical aid. Uh, a lot of people aren't aware of it, but there's a section 6A2, um, I mean a small a, which says that whatever medical aid you pay in a foreign country, to their foreign medical scheme is still tax deductible in South Africa. So you can claim on that. And then to reduce your tax burden in South Africa, you can always um, still have pension you pay in South Africa, which will be deductible against the income you earn in um, Singapore. And we'll look at the tax example later. I see you've got the, the screen open of how section six part works. So all right, in short, what you'll have for a natural person, and again, this is a natural person, You'll have your normal tax payable after we've gone and said, listen here, this is all your income, your different incomes, here are your exemptions, and which the section 10 will also apply. We say, you've earned 2 million rand converted into rands. In Singapore, we deduct the 1.25 million, there's 750,000 payable, we calculate the tax on it, and then we say, all right, after we've calculated the tax payable on it, which is the normal tax payable where you are, then we say, let's deduct the primary and secondary and whatever rebates are applicable to you in terms of section six, because that's still available for you. That's not falling away just because you're not living in South Africa. And I, th I think I want to take one step back as well. Just remember, we're applying the tax tables still from naught, 280,000, 180 to 250. So you're enjoying a progressive increase in the tax rates that still applies to you. They're not just taxing you at 45%. It starts at 18% and it works its way up. Then we'll have a medical aid scheme tax credit we can claim for you. And that's that 319 rand per person for first two people per month, then 200 and something rand, I think 209 rand or something to that like for every, um, what do you call it, person you'll have afterwards on your medical aid. And just pertaining to medical aids, uh, what we've seen a lot is that while you live abroad, you might start paying your uh, folks you know, your, your brother or your parents or your grandparents tax, in, not tax, medical aid in South Africa. And that we see a lot. That medical aid you pay on behalf of somebody else is also tax deductible in your hands. And we'll claim it under the same line we see there under Section 6. 6B will be applicable if you're older than 65, but you get additional tax benefits. And then after that, we claim your foreign tax rebate in terms of Section 6 quad. So this will be the taxes you've paid in Singapore, now we deduct the tax from the South African tax burden. And as you can see, just going from the top, we calculate the South African tax liability, then we deducted your primary and secondary rebates, then we deducted your medical aid, then we deducted additional medical aid that was available, and now Section 6 squad kicks in, and then you land up with a final taxable payable in South Africa. And so, and we're going to have a look at the example now, but practically speaking, the tax liability you'll be left with in South Africa will really be very small. Um, yeah, it, it would abs be, oh, uh, absolutely, Jan. We, we can see, um, just looking at this, we have different, many different layers to help reduce the tax payable. Um, unfortunately, we've actually run out of time. I, I don't know where time's gone. We, we were just flying through this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up the next slide so people can see how does this work in reality. Right. And uh, I'll just leave it there. And... Johan, if it's okay, I've just got a few questions to ask you then. All right, let's see through. if I can answer. So everyone, I know a month for now is exactly six o'clock. 
Um, if we could go on for five more minutes, just simply to answer two or three questions here, and um, then call it a night and, and enjoy the long weekend. So, question that's come through. All right. We've had, uh, how is the 183 days calculated? Claudia, I can send you um, that slide later and you'll be able to see it. All right, next one. If you left South Africa after university, you have no assets in South Africa or had assets in South Africa. You've never worked in South Africa. You've never paid tax in South Africa. You've been offshore for more than 10 years. You're a permanent resident in Singapore. And the, so based on ordinary resident factors, you are not a South African ordinarily resident. Would that be assumed to be correct? My answer to that would be definitely yes. Um, the problem you've got, you never were registered for South African income tax in the scenario assumed. So you can't file a return to prove it. But whenever in the future you might be challenged on it, you can say, but look, this is all my evidence. I've never been tax resident in South Africa and I'm not deemed to be they will do the ordinary resident test and you should succeed not being liable for tax in South Africa. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a very well painted picture for SARS and they have a difficult argument there. Um, we've now had a very interesting um, question come up where someone is, um, they own a business in South Africa as well as yes. a business in Singapore. So they are the owners of the business. Yeah and they are intending to settle in Ireland at a later stage. Um, they visit South Africa twice a year. Do you think they would be consider ordi considered ordinarily resident in South Africa? The, the chances are very well because deciding to settle in Ireland at some future stage, that can change. I mean, that's not set in stone. So currently you're sitting with Singapore and South Africa, and then we'll actually go back to the test to say, where are your national boat? Where do you live? Where's your circle of influence? And where's everything happening? And SARS would like to tax you in South Africa. That's for sure. So in that scenario, I would actually just complete the tax return and say, I've left if you don't want to be taxed in South Africa. But you can even see from a slide that's on the screen now, the tax liability in South Africa will not be that high. So just consider that. Maybe take some professional opinion. You can send us an email. We can look at your scenario. Because um, maybe you have to do nothing at this stage, but if you want to be dead sure not to be taxed, then let's file a tax return, say you're not a resident anymore, pay the exit tax, and then it's done. Well, if, if it doesn't get challenged further, but it doesn't sound like it should be challenged further. Um, but we'll make an argument saying you put business on both sides. And then we just have to look at how structured that is and how interrelated. Agreed. Um, well, I think everyone... Uh, I really hope you found this of great benefits. Johan and I have worked very hard together in the past three to four weeks to ensure <laughs> we could make this as comprehensive and try to fit all of this highly detailed information into one hour. Obviously, these questions could go on forever and there's a lot of content here. Um, Johan is the professional and um, I would really highly suggest after we've uh, been in contact and we've sent you the slides, um, and we've sent you further reading. If you still have questions, get in touch with Johan, have a formal assessment done, and you know where you stand. Um, so Johan, thank you very much for your time. I'm gonna you, just hand over to Nigel, and he will just uh, address everyone to say uh, thanks. Uh, Johan, thank you, thank you very much. That was, uh, that was great, and Michael, uh, great all the host you did there, thanks for Thanks for fielding all the questions. Um, and to everybody that joined us today, thank you very much. I hope you found that informative. I did too. Um, and uh, we will do a bit of a debrief session, uh, answer any additional questions that came up. And, uh, and we will post them to the people that uh, joined uh, through to today. But uh, thank you very much uh, for everything. And Johan, you get back to work and we here in Singapore will call it a day. <laughs> All right. Enjoy guys. Be good. Yeah, thank, thank you very, very much, much everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.